Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. It is with a great pleasure that I have today Emma Muleman, who's a CFA, she's a portfolio manager, strategist, Austrian economist, uh, and uh, a tremendous expert in everything that has to do with uh, the, in particular the US economy, but global economy as well. You should follow her on Twitter. You'll get all of her details in the description of the video below. But first and fo foremost, how are you, Emma? I'm doing well, how are you? Very well, very well. Glad to have this, this chat. Um, Emma, I would like to start uh, talking a little bit about what's happening in the economy. Uh, we're seeing this massive chain of stimulus, uh, huge deficit spending, uh, incredible uh, reaction from the central bank uh, that an unprecedented level of, um, of monetary easing. And at the same time, we're, uh, the new stimulus plans seem to be including a large tax increases. So I would like to get a little bit of your view about uh, what is this doing to the economy? What are the risks? How do you see in general the situation? So I see it as really a, a rapid expansion of what we've already been doing for a while. So ever since you know 2008 and the response to that with a lot of QE and a lot of you know de, de facto money printing and just you know flooding the markets with liquidity. Um, causes companies that would otherwise go bankrupt to be able to stick around um, and to the point where, you know, the more and more of that you do, once you get started on that path, it's like trying to push a rock, a, a gigantic rock that's rolling downhill up a hill. It's, incrementally, you get less and less from each new stimulus, right? And now we've taken it from something that when you saw it after 2009, and it looked like I mean, like to me, I was blown away. Like, how could they take the balance sheet from here to here? I mean, now we're at like seven to seven trillion. And it's just like, it, it's, it's orders of magnitude different. And so it, that has um, huge implications. I mean, really across the board uh, in the United States and, and abroad, because a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's all a relative system and uh, several countries import US monetary policy being the reserve currency. It also obviously has an impact on emerging markets and what have you. Um, so that's that's kind of how I see it in, in the short of it. But um, it distorts the capital allocation mechanism, which is something that really um, has concerned me for a few years now. Um, and I, I a few people talk about it, but not not not, not very often. And I think you know part of the the passive revolution, whatever you want to call it is due to the fact that markets just keep going up. And why do markets keep going up? Well, because central bankers keep supporting them. Um, and so if, the, if there was more you know, volatility in markets and more, more you know, general instability, like while under the surface, there's a ton of instability, um, apparent instability, let's say, perceived instability, um, while that's low, you know, millennials think, okay, I'm just going to buy, buy index funds, just put the money in an index fund. And as our demographics are at this state, uh, you've got more baby boomers retiring, and they're the ones that were invested in active managers in the first place. And your incremental dollars coming from millennials, say, are going straight to passive. So net, net, you have more that it's an incremental dollar that goes into the investment, or let's call it equity markets, or let's call it equity and bond markets, um, but really the markets um, goes more than 100% of that incremental dollar goes into passive. And so that's, I, I think, is tied to what's going on with monetary policy, because monetary policy has enabled it, if you will. And when you have the incremental or more than the incremental dollar going into passive, it just, it means that those who were the biggest in market share terms, because oftentimes these are market cap weighted, just continue to be the biggest regardless of how they perform, regardless of whether they have honest and good management teams, regardless of whether they are investing in um, countries where genocide is occurring, you know, it, it, it can, you know, really, end up in a disastrous effect on the productive capacity of an economy. Mm -hmm. 
Because, as I always say, monetary policy is never neutral. Money creation always disproportionately benefits the first recipients of the newly created money and uh, affects more negatively those that are uh, that have either savings or that uh, or real wages certainly uh, one of the things that um, you just mentioned is this change of behavior from the from the investor from active management and looking for uh, edge uh, or alpha in markets uh, than, uh, to uh, a view that basically markets simply go up because central banks are always pushing markets higher. So we'll go into, into passive funds. However, that definitely does increase significantly the level of risk that people are taking and probably the level of risk compared to what they think that they're taking. Doesn't it uh, uh, look like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the narrative has been, if you're if you're talking about the narrative that you know comes from the media or to your average non-financial person, is just that the ETFs are the safe way to go, right? But the, what they, I, you know, I don't know how they might behave if they thought through to the logical end game and how that would affect and distort the, you know, say prices of like if if we took this as a philosophical argument, like to its logical end. Uh, you would have like only one restaurant left. That was McDonald's, whichever the one that had the biggest market cap in that cap weighted index, you know, pretending that there's one. Okay. Um, but, but what you, what you, what I'm saying here is like, like we, we as consumers benefit from uh, the dynamism of, of an economy and the innovation that is given to. So when you've got small companies, they need money so they can innovate. But if all the money is just being driven into large, ETFs and passive indexes, then all these small companies with a lot of potential and would, that would otherwise contribute to you know, a dynamic and, and grow, growing economy aren't getting the capital that they need. Um, and then add on to that, which is kind of a side point, but uh, <laughs> the latest thing we hear yesterday about Biden um, was thinking about increasing capital gains tax to 43% on the, well, on the wealthiest, which always becomes you know, uh, the wealthiest is first at first those with the over a million, and then it's those with five hundred thousand, and then it's uh, two hundred thousand. You know what I mean? It's it's a slippery slope as just as well as um, QE is. <laughs> um, but but the, what the point I wanted to make there was that even further stifles innovation because you've got like you've got private equity that venture capitalists that are investing in small companies and they're making huge capital gains when. And they also take a lot of risks and they suffer losses on the companies that don't innovate or they, are, or they don't win in that market, whatever, they get less lucky. Um, but that, that's part of the business, right? And if you don't have money going into that, uh, you, you lose a huge part of America's you know, economic growth and, and, and competitive edge, right? It's our IP. And so I think you add that to, add that to the mix and things just aren't looking pretty. Yeah. You mentioned the the misallocation of capital as a, as an important driver of uh, that uh, stifling of innovation, uh, and I think that one of the of the big risks that we see in this so called bailout of everything is that. Uh, you have completely abandoned the most important concept of innovation and economic growth, which is that you need some form of creative destruction, that there needs to be uh, the process in which the, the, the winners can actually gain market share from those that are becoming obsolescent. And one mm. of the problems that we see, for example, in, in the Eurozone and Japan from these massive stimuli is that most of the capital is actually going to perpetuate overcapacity in sectors that were already in overcapacity before the, mm. the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, and at the same time uh, are preventing new sectors from coming in and generate higher paid jobs and, and, and better economic growth. So mm -hmm. the point that I'm trying to, to make is, is where do you, or the, the question is actually, where do you think that the biggest risk for the average American, the average American that is watching us right now, or the average citizen all over the world that is watching us right now sees, well, everything that you're saying sounds very nice, but I don't see where's 
the negative for me. I see that mm, the market is going up. I see that uh, mm, nothing is, is so bad as they told me that it was going to be. So where is the negative? What, what do you think we can say to them to make them understand the impact of this, of this massive in, uh, intervention in markets? You know, it's a hard thing to to get them to understand, and I, I'm not trying to say that they are in, in any way less intelligent, but um, it's, it's a complex setup. But um, if you, so it, and it also depends on who you're talking to. So if we're talking to somebody who earns 500 grand a year and already owns a property, then, you know, their situation is going to be very different from one like um, a recent college graduate who say has a decent earning job, good technical skills, but no, still no assets. The value of their real, real wages is, is growing very slowly relative to the about the prices of goods such as most most importantly or but what most importantly in my heart right now is, is housing prices i mean and now that you have this order of magnitude increase in the in the stimulus with in the central bank balance sheet size this the seven trillion i mean just think of that order of magnitude relative to post 2008 like yeah. we were all shocked by post 2008 now look at look at where we are now i wonder what that's going to do to home prices in the United States um, and, and to income inequality and to you know, the, the continued and growing economic disparity between the rich and the lesser, you know, the middle class and the middle class kind of gets wiped away in a sense. About 150 million people have apparently been wiped out of the middle class in uh, 2020, according to, to some estimates, 150 million people. And obviously, they, they, they were all I hear in the, in the media and the political discourse is that this is all to blame uh, for, you have to blame capitalism uh, uh, for this. But I don't see capitalism here. I see a lot of statism when we're, we're, what you're basically getting is the, the most aggressive government uh, displacement of the rest of the real economy with the aid of both monetary and fiscal policy. So if, yeah, and if, if you are, say, an American citizen and you want to understand, you know, who's the bad guy? Is it capitalism or is it interventionism? Uh, just look at Italy. Look at Europe. Um, let me look at Japan, but Japan's on a different, you know, demographic scale. So, so is Europe, but not so much. They're more comparable, right? So you can look at Italy's unemployment rate. Look at uh, what kind of kind of opportunities you have coming out of college in Italy or in Portugal, you know, or, you know, Absolutely. even in France. I mean, look at that and say, okay, well, they took they took the interventionist approach. They are they they tend to be more interventionist leaning than than the United States is. Do you want that approach? You, you'll have, what you, you could probably know, you probably know the statistic off, off the top of your head for unemployment in Italy right now, but it's, it's very high and small. It's like almost impossible due to red tape to create a small business. Um, your opportunities are just, I mean, I would, I don't want to be parabolic, but pretty dire. Yeah. Um, so that's what you get if you, if you want to vote for interventionism, and I think you you will come to find that that's not going to suit you well, and maybe you know the world works in cycles, and people figure out, whoops, we did that wrong. Now let's flip the other way, and hopefully the United States can retain that kind of you know back and forth dynamism. But uh, you know I'm getting nervous as as a lot of people are. Well, I, and I understand that because a lot of the things that I hear in the United States are, well, we should try, no? Let's try what they did in Europe. Let's try what they did in the, in the Eurozone economies. Uh, let's remember that before the COVID-19 crisis and all of the impacts is that unemployment was twice as high in the average of the Eurozone compared to the United States. Uh, and that and that twice as high as the average. You look at, for example, Spain with 17% uh, unemployment, and you look at other countries that have, that when they're extremely successful are talking about uh, 5% uh, level of unemployment, no? Mm -hmm. And people tend to forget the crowding out effect 
of government spending, and um, which basically means that government is 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 with is taking more and more resources out of the economy, and by taking more resources out of the economy, it's not just uh, malinvesting and and overspending. It is also creating less opportunities for the private sector, which competes unfavorably with much higher rates, with much more difficult access to credit, and obviously has to suffer the tax burden, no? Which takes us to this monster stimulus package that we have just uh, heard in the United States, uh, the, the, the new allegedly infrastructure plan, which uh, I find interesting because I don't see a lot of infrastructure there. What, what is your view? Uh, so I haven't I haven't read you know the bill and looked into the details probably not even nearly as much as you have so uh, I don't I wouldn't say I'm totally qualified to talk about exactly where the money is going but I I don't my understanding of the way that it's allocated is not in a way that is actually productive to uh, you know growth or recovery it's more um, productive to politicians staying in power and giving away promises short term to keep mm -hmm. people. Yeah, it, it, it's been this way since, you know, the time since, of, I feel like ages, you know, politicians promise things so that they can get reelected. I mean, they have, they have, that's their incentive structures, right? So mm -hmm. when they, when they, when they get, you know, the when they're given enough power and that kind of money, and you've got now, whether we want to admit it or not, de facto MMT, I mean, you had on that surprise Sunday uh, last year when the Fed came out and introduced a three trillion uh, recoveries, you know, plan. Uh, they teamed up with the fiscal authorities and created a, a special that which was pre previously illegal in the United States, supposed to be independent, right? That there was no independence. Um, they created a, a special purpose vehicle so that they could go up and buy up corporate bonds and corporate bond ETFs, HYG, uh, Black, BlackRock, uh, you know, corporate debt and, and, and high yield debt. Uh, and they're still buying that, right? $120 billion a month, I think. So if they're still buying that yet, we're in this recovery phase, right? We're in this recovery, reflationary phase, yes. Uh, why do they need to keep doing that? Mm. You know, one must, is, is a question that comes to mind. Absolutely. Uh, that is one of the things that I find fascinating about the discourse of uh, that that uh, I read in most of consensus uh, reports. No, which is uh, if you, if there's such a massive recovery and you're going to have a 12% GDP increase in two years in the United States and unemployment is going to go back to three and a half percent with wage growth at three, then why are you betting on not this stimulus plan but at least two more and the Fed continuing its policy. It, I find it absolutely fascinating, which leads us to the point that you just mentioned, which is the, the de facto MMT, you know, the modern, modern monetary theory, uh, theory uh, which is not modern. <laughs> it's been implemented for, for centuries and it's not a theory. Uh, what, what do you think uh, are the risks of um, getting into a situation in which the confidence in the US dollar starts to starts to crack. So um, to be honest, I mean, I think the, I'm, I'm, I'm highly concerned. Um, I'm not so concerned in terms of short term. Yeah. So say the next year or two, but highly concerned when we look at the next five years, 10 years. Um, I mean, if we continue to you know, have this basically say we say we full on just admit it. MMT is the way it is. We're just going to spend. So there's a, there's a there's a component here where for the global economy to function, the U.S. has to run deficits, right? Because we've got to supply incremental money growth, right? Just a little bit, but we but massive deficits and just monetizing our own debt takes us back to like an article I wrote when I was, I think I was like 17 years old called Japanification. Yeah. It's like, you look, but you think a lot of things have changed, but you look back, look back at that article. It's like, nothing has changed. <laughs> We're still following Japanification. Europe's gone there. Europe's on its way. Right. And, and we're on our way. Right. And so, so then maybe we talk about Japan. What's when, so right now the only person who, I mean, the only buyer of, Japanese bonds or Japanese 
corporate bonds is the is the Japanese is the BOJ, right? Mm -hmm. So they're the only buyer. And so the next stage would be, you know, full on debt jubilee. And then so what happens then? Well, that's a currency issue, right? And so, which brings me back to the dollar. Um, if we follow that path, we are going to, we will lose our reserves currency status. I mean, it's, I think long-term, you know, barring some unusual or, I mean, it, nobody retains reserve status forever. There's been a lot of different reserve currencies over time. So even if we did everything right, you know, who knows what would be the reserve currency or if we would even be talking about fiat money at, you know, 50 to 100 years from now. But pretending that we're still talking about fiat money or say, yeah, let's just pretending we're still talking about fiat money, uh, you know, 20 years from now, the dollar could easily lose its, lose, lose its reserve status. And so that, that's certainly a, certainly a problem when, you have, when you've got mm. reckless politicians in bed with the, the people who can print money. So it's, you know, if I rob a bank, I'm, I'm, I go to jail. But if, if the Fed and the politicians rob the people, then they call it good, good news. Yeah, one of the things that um, uh, we're talking about the reserve status of the U U.S. dollar, and uh, obviously right now, the U.S. dollar is relatively strong because everybody else is implementing a much more aggressive monetary policy. This is a game of relatives, as you said very well before. But we have different things uh, in the in, in in the headlines out there that start to that start to raise questions about the monetary system in its entirety now uh, one is obviously cryptocurrencies the other is uh, the digital currency that central banks are talking about i would like to uh, get your view about about those two what is your view about cryptocurrencies do you think that that is something that is going to continue to be uh, driven as an alternative to fiat currencies. Uh, and what is your view about the central bank digital currencies uh, that are being uh, sort of at least hinted by some of them? Mm -hmm. so, so recent developments have made this even more thorny, but I've, I've long had a view even before people ever talked about a central bank digital currency of, about the idea of, of banning cash, which is a very similar thing. Um, it gives the monetary you know, authorities a way to you know, just grab money from savers banking accounts directly and take it. I mean, they can just, they can just steal directly from you and allocate it as they wish, uh, rather than, you know, it, which actually increases people's proclivity to save as bizarre as that would, is counterintuitive, but, um, so, so if, if and now we'll tell, now we have to talk about what's happened with China and the, their announcement of the digital one. So because of the, their rapid plans for this, this digital one, it's become more urgent for other central banks to Western central banks, particularly to consider how they're going to respond to that and how they're going to compete with that or hopefully just ban interaction with it altogether, which would then make it a failure in China and China would end up back with, you know, their standard RMB, um, which, which, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully that, that would be the case. And then we never end up with the, any central bank digital currency <laughs> that I, I would prefer that. But um, unfortunately, I don't think that's the way we're going. Um, I haven't heard I've heard from, you know, so I think Mark Carney was one of the first ones to really come out and say, talk about it a couple of years ago. And you, you know, the, the, I guess you know, some 80% of central banks around the world are at some phase of looking at or evaluating implementation of some of a central bank digital currency. So in my, you know, I, I don't know the future, but I, I, see, I, I would bet if I had to, that we will end up with central bank digital currencies. Now, my hope is that somehow the power, you know, to simply, you know, reallocate money and 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 you know take from the rich and or take from whomever the a politician deems uh, worthy of taking him from and giving to is 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 somehow, you know, controlled. Yeah. I, 
I, yeah. you know, who knows what will happen, but it's, it's, it's definitely not something that it's not a great development in my mind. Um, and it, it's unfortunate that, you know, we've got to, and I don't think that, you know, it's necessarily the only way to combat the digital one, but it's just kind of the way the world's moving. And in terms of something like Bitcoin, you know, I have substantial wealth. So well, here's a disclosure. I have substantial wealth that's tied up, but it's not tied up, but it's in Bitcoin. Um, but at the same time, I'd be more than happy to lose every bit of it as, to, to preserve democracy and capitalism. So, you know, when I, with what happened over the weekend, and I think a lot of people didn't really see this in the headlines, is if you, you, if you, were, if you were following it, you would have noticed on Sunday, it really started, Bitcoin really started selling off. That was, uh, it was down between Friday and I think Monday or Monday or Tuesday, it was down 14%. Um, it really started selling off on Sunday. And um, what I came to learn in the next couple of days was that um, one tiny coal mine, there was a flood at a tiny coal mine in one of 61 counties in China's Xinjiang, or I'm not sure how do you say it right, but um, the region where they're actually in putting a lot of people against their will in mass concentration camps. Um, in that region, there's so, but the bottom line here is that one coal mine took out 35% of Bitcoin's transaction processing capability, taking wow. taking it the price so the the price to transact or to make a payment and send, send money to somebody um, went from sixteen dollars to fifty two dollars basically instantaneously, um, and so that's when the sell off started started occurring. You know, a lot of people this isn't in the mainstream media, so people have to do their research to um, see what's going on here. But one, you've got Xi parading around on a, and, and Biden like putting it, him in like, I don't know, a high regard as if he's some sort of, you know, climate, uh, like he's some sort of climate, you know, a great client, a great person who's all focused on um, helping helping save the world, which is which is a, a pure comedy. When I saw that, I was just like, it's, this is, I was like half awake going like, I'm just laughing at this point. I, I, I can't, I can't take, I can't, I can't take this seriously anymore. Um, but, you know, anyway, this is, this is coal mine, mines that are out there doing this uh, Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin miners, and they in China control over 65% of global Bitcoin mining. So what that puts into the spotlight is which people didn't know before because we could because you know china is very opaque especially in that region um we couldn't no one could really put a number on what was the actual uh mining per percentage that was being done by china but now we can say with certainty that roughly 65 percent or more is being done in china okay so what does that so what does that mean for bitcoin um, well, as China gets more and more desperate for dollars and more and more desperate to, you know, paper over those bad debts, just keep that system from imploding, keep the world to believe, believing that they have control over their, their debt situation so that, that they can keep international money flowing in, whether it's in the capital, well, mostly in the capital, from the capital uh, account, um, capital, from capital accounts, so Western investors or investors around the world, they need that money. Um, and so, so the, the facade that they have to keep, keep up is to make it look like they've got a stable system, nothing's going to go wrong, right? And so they get increasingly desperate as they have to keep rolling bad debts, you know? And so if, if, they, if they are, you know, in, a, in a, a confrontation with the West or they simply reach a point where things are going to break if they don't get some more money, they could execute what's called a 51% attack. Um, and basically be uh, just spending my Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, they just, you know, they, you just spend one Bitcoin as multiple Bitcoins. And, um, and so there's a MIT has done a paper about what, what a 51% attack is. People can look that up. I can share the link if you'd like, um, if you can Google it and you'll find plenty of stuff on it, but that makes me kind of, I, previously would have said, yeah, great. Bitcoin's great. You know, now I'm a little um, reluctant. There. Very interesting. Very interesting. One of the things that uh, this massive um, money printing and deficit spending uh, orgy that we're living right now 
uh, is, is generating is the, uh, uh, an expansion in the role of government and the, and the impact of government in the economy uh, to unprecedented levels. At the same time, the MMT defenders say, well, if you massively increase the amount of money available, uh, you will, uh, and inflation starts to creep up, then what you have to do is tax away that newly created money in order to avoid inflationary pressures, which I find very interesting because what, you bas what they basically say is, let's massively increase money. Uh, money supply in order to balloon the size of government and the economy. And once that generates inflation, we increase further the size of government and the economy by taxing the last recipients of money, uh, which are real wages and savers. Uh, so what do you think are the, are the possibilities that citizens have right now in order to avoid that, uh, that that situation actually happens? Is it, is it doomed to happen or do you think? I don't think it's doomed. I don't think it's doomed. Um, I think, it, I don't think we're going back to normal rates anytime soon, if ever. Um, once you go down this rabbit hole, you really can't get out. But I don't think it's inevitable that, that, that you can't, um, you know, if, if the public gets fed up enough, you know, we've got 2022, and then, then another election, you know, you could install different leaders and get rid of people who are MMT years. And because <clears throat> once people feel that effect actually hit their bank account or say the MMT years are throwing money at their bank accounts to try and make them feel good. But when that, that money just doesn't make them feel good anymore because the incremental, the incremental efficacy of, of just printing checks is it, it goes on a rapidly declining, there's a declining marginal efficacy there. When people actually realize what's going on, they, they can vote differently. And hopefully, you know, our, our, our political systems are still in place such that, you know, people can vote in the way that they vote will actually be counted properly. You know, I'm not su suggesting anything about what happened last election, but just, you know, I, I don't want to assume anything either. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, I don't think that, I don't think that, I don't think there's nothing, I don't think it's, we're doomed, but it's starting to feel more and more that way. And then the other thing is if you have earnings right now and you have some ability to save, I mean, I don't care what it takes. Go, don't live in your fancy thing. You, you don't need a new, you don't need a new gigantic TV every five years. You save everything you can and get it invested in property, get it invested in tangible assets, because those are going to be inflated as, as more, if MMT continues this way, you're going to want to own something or else you're just going to become even more and more about what I would almost call it like a slave to the system. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of how, the nature of the beast. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a reason why, uh, you, you mentioned before Italy, Spain, Portugal. There is a reason why citizens in those countries have such an interest and such a, 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 a they, they are, they're always looking to mostly invest in property. The reason is that before we had the euro, when uh, the, the governments were constantly devaluing the currency to uh, do exactly what, uh, the, the, what the Biden administration is telling that they want to do right now, um, when they were constantly devaluing the currency, people found only one way to get uh, a little bit of, uh, of protection from the destruction of the purchasing power of the currency, which was, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, uh, property, absolutely. One mm -hmm. question uh, about the, you talked about the digital yuan and, uh, and uh, the, the, the need of other central banks to try to find a way to compete with that. Uh, has no one thought that the best way to compete against a digital yuan or uh, or any other digital currency is sound money? Uh, it seems like sound money's gone out the window a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, no, I mean, of course, obviously, like people like you, myself, and you know, a lot, a lot of you know, probably people in the older age brackets who you know have have 
some, you know, identify with sound money policies and that, you know, interest rates actually matter and they like, they represent like the cost of borrowing and money and the price of money and, you know, these things that like make economies work and then businesses thrive and the world go around. Um, those people that are still attached, that still have some attachment to uh, economic gravity and, and yeah. reality, um, they exist, but um, <laughs> you know, in the political circles, they've become uh, fewer and fewer and far between. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. What you mentioned though, was um, something I wanted to ask you about was, you know a lot about Europe. Yeah. Um, I've always thought, and I may be wrong, but when I, I, read, a, I read a book um, about the creation of the Euro, uh, Bernard Connolly, is that yeah. his name? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I always kind of had the impression that the Euro, the, the creation of the Euro as a whole has really, has really hurt the pigs and the, you know, like, like say, say Greece, Italy, Spain, countries who, yes, they were overly indebted, but really the French and the Germans colluded, it seems like based on that book, at least, um, and, and pushing this creation of a euro, whereas, say, say if I'm in Greece and I want to buy a turkey sandwich, it's going to cost me like six bucks U.S. or seven bucks U.S. Or if I could just walk across the border to Turkey and get it for, which is on a lira, and we know that the lira hasn't done so well lately, and there's some authoritarian problems going on over there. Let's pretend that that's not going on right at this moment. Just looking at currencies, being able to, they need to reflect the economic and productive capacity of a given economy. So if you're gonna enforce a, a German standard currency on uh, a, a Greek economy, you're going to stifle growth and you're going, you're going to, like, you're almost guaranteed that they're gonna need more debt, they're gonna need bailouts and it's gonna continue. Yeah. And so, so my, my thoughts were always like, the Euro should have never been <laughs> they would have been better off not having created it, the single currency. Um, but it's a good point, but 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 it's. Uh, and I read the book uh, uh, and also Stiglitz's uh, Euro book, uh, but it it starts from a flawed premise, which is that in none of those countries were doing well before the euro. Hmm? Is mm -hmm. that is the this idea that. Uh, the that Spain, Portugal, Greece, Italy were hugely competitive, and they had uh, they had uh, the possibility of printing money, and that helped them to overcome crisis, etc. I'll give you an example. No, before the uh, between 1980 and uh, the beginning of the euro, the average unemployment in Spain was 17 percent. So the point is that. Uh, uh, using the subterfuge of a uh, local currency to uh, sort of uh, devalue the problems away actually doesn't devalue the problems away. It just it doesn't make them more competitive. Spain, Portugal, Greece were not more competitive by having a weak currency. More importantly, when everything that they had to borrow fundamentally had to be borrowed in, an, in another currency because no one was stupid. The first one, the, the, local, uh, the local savers that did not want local currency risk when they purchased bonds, no? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this idea that, so the, so the reason why the Euro has succeeded uh, and continues to exist is fundamentally because the citizens of Europe, you mentioned the, the demographic, who are, who are aging, but have quite a bit of history of understanding the, the monetary challenges is that they prefer the Euro and the challenges of the Euro than the certainty of being wiped out of your savings every sort of six to eight years uh, mm -hmm. by the so-called competitive devaluations. So yeah. I think that the problem of the Euro was different is that with the Euro, came the possibility that a country that does not have that level of competitiveness or that level of capital access uh, borrows against the competitiveness and the capital uh, and, the, uh, and the human and, and, and uh, industrial capital of another country. So basically mm -hmm. Spain, Greece, Portugal 
could borrow against the German productive fabric or against the French productive fabric. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, what, that's what, it, what creates the challenges. And that's why the Eurozone has gone to be a massive debt machine. Huh? Exactly. Okay. That's where I was going with that. Like, how, how does that manifest itself in a banking system in, in Europe? Is exactly, exactly. What you don't see in 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 a in a weak currency and a disaster of uh, in capital markets, you see in elevated debt. So it's basically in reality there's not there's very little. If you look at product, for example, productivity growth in many of these countries has been zero in this in the period since they joined the, the Eurozone. Not because there weren't uh, ways of increasing competitiveness and productivity, but because there were tremendous perverse incentives to hide the structural problems with higher debt. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's where I think that the risk of the United States is, is that they look at that and they say, I like the idea. And, I'm say, and I always say, oh, you shouldn't. Huh? Oh, it seems like they follow it. They follow in the path, to just like, just like Europe kind of has followed behind Japan. We just follow behind Japan and Europe. I yeah. mean, um, you know, I'm hoping. You know, we we can always, you know, hope that the the setup, the political or structural setup of our political system allows us to escape. Um, you know, following right right on down the same path that we've been going. But, um, you know. Who knows? Maybe the future's in Southeast Asia and we all just better get planning. <laughs> and when, when you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the risk to free markets that is generated by this massive perverse incentive to uh, increase debt, lower interest rates, then more uh, central bank intervention, which elevates uh, asset valuations. Um, do you see a risk to free markets uh, as we know them? Uh, do you think that we have we're in a situation in which that is is truly under threat? I, I absolutely. I mean, and, and a lot of it comes back to the fact that well, one, the more and more the government is is involved in running or managing our, our, an economy, the less there is to the free market, you know, entrepreneurs to you know. To create, uh, you know, a new innovation and, and you know, enact creative destruction, um, or the, there's less forces of creative destruction at play, right? Um, less access to capital for private entrepreneurs who want to create new things and innovate and drive, do the things that drive productivity, that drive wealth, that drive growth, that drive real wage growth, um, and more. Uh, incompetent and um, highly inefficient, overpaid <laughs> government, <laughs> government bureaucracy, right? Um, I mean, you don't have to look at that much history to see, you know, or even just go to your local DMV if you live in the United States. If that's how you would like your every business to treat you, uh, then then you can, you can vote for the politicians who are currently in charge and, and that's what you'll get. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, just to wrap up, uh, what what are the, the main? You, you mentioned a couple of uh, uh, suggestions for for savers, no? But what are your main thoughts about where and how to invest into the next couple of years for our viewers? Okay, so it, if I'm not sure exactly what what the viewing demographic looks like. Um, I mean, I, I do a lot in the options markets, so I don't know if I want to go go there. But because um, it may people, it's a dangerous place if you if you don't if if you're not something like somebody who usually you know, yeah. partakes in this market. And so I don't want to encourage people to act like GameStop call buyers with a two two week expiry, like <laughs> like pure speculation, or go buy Dogecoin and see what happens. You know. <laughs> um, I would say you know you want to get you want to save and save and buy hard assets things that are tangible stuck to the ground or you know commodities like you know um if we are going to have infrastructure and we're going to have if we are going to electrify then we're going to need a lot of copper um you know that is a hard asset it you know it can lose a lot of value but it's i mean and, and if you're talking the next year or two years 
you could just continue buying. I mean, I, I feel very, you know, I don't feel good saying this. You, you can buy your index fund and, and just hope it continues to work. It probably will for two years, but, but um, that's a, you know, it's intellectually dishonest. It's not, you know, it's not a good game to have to play, but it's, it's the situation we find ourselves in. So you have to be I, realistic. I, huh? yeah. Right. I'd recommend before doing that, or, or trying to, maybe you have some of your money in that in the meantime, as you're saving, so you can quickly get your money into property, hard yeah. assets, so that, you know, as, as fiat is increasingly debased, you will have something of value. So just as a final question, I, I guess that all of us uh, may, may guess the answer, but your view about inflation is that it's a stickier, not temporary, as, uh, as the Fed is saying. Oh, I love how the Fed always, everything is transitory with the Fed, right? Um, so, it, 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 and there's different ways to define inflation. So I'm actually of the view that we are in a, a low growth. They're going to continue to have rates be very low. Um, you know, you get a post-pandemic pop. And then after that, you're right back to where you were, but in a way worse off situation because you've already loaded on even more debt. And that has a, what is it called? A re self-reinforcing um, feedback loop, if you will, uh, the more and more debt you load on, the you you have defaults and, and it, it just leads itself into more and more slow growth. The inflation has been more uh, sticky, uh, uh, less uh, less of a temporary thing than what the Fed Inflation, said. Yeah, inflation in, in, in things like property prices, health healthcare, um, yeah. you know, education, uh, but that could change with technology, who knows, um, but healthcare, and that will see benefits from technology, but then of course the heavy regulatory hand steps in and gives monopoly power to, you know, so I wouldn't uh, bet on that getting cheaper either. Uh, but I mean, everybody's got to live somewhere, right? And yeah. it's just, it's going to continue to give inflated asset prices to those who own, own assets and, and hurt the real wages of, of those who don't. Absolutely. Well, Emma, it's been absolutely riveting. Great, great conversation for all of you that are watching. All of the details to follow Emma will be on the description of the video below. Make sure that you follow her on social media because there's a lot to learn from the things that she that she publishes. Thank you so much uh, for your for your insight and for your uh, for your generosity with your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Daniel. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.